Our scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 19. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us, as if by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the Prince of Life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus, which strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise so in our scripture for today, we find Peter and John standing for, before a crowd as Peter primarily addresses them. And this is often referred to in biblical history as Peter's second sermon. And now the reason that the people have gathered around them is we don't really see that in our scripture is that they had just healed a lame beggar at one of the gates to the temple. And this act was done during the ninth hour of the day, which would have been one of three times during the day that the people would have come to the temple to pray. So as they're walking in, the beggar stops them and asks them for money. And Peter replies to him, Look at us. We don't have any money to give you. However, we do have this to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand and walk. Now this man had been unable to walk from the day he was born. He had been lame since birth, as, as he's described. And he had been accustomed to being brought to the gate to beg every day in order to survive. And no doubt the people that had passed through the gate had seen him there day after day. And perhaps they had stopped to give him money so that he could survive. Perhaps they simply walked by him day after day and paid him no attention. And I'm absolutely sure there were others that stopped and cursed him every day for being on the way to the temple. How dare you sit and beg at our place of worship? But after this man is healed, this is when the crowd begins to come around Peter. And what a miracle that they have witnessed. This man who has been lame since birth now rises and walks. Now, I don't believe God set scenes like this on accident. He knew that the temple would be crowded. He knew that the people would know this beggar. And they would know that he had been lame since birth. And he knew that the people who saw him walking would recognize it as a miracle. So Peter is blessed with what all preachers hope for, a captive audience. No, not really a captive audience, but one that is prepared to hear his words. One that is ready to believe the things that he is saying. And now Peter says what all preachers should be willing to say, and that is this. What are you looking at me for? It's not me that's done this great work. It's God. It's the God of Abraham and Isaac, which is saying to them, it is your God, the God of your ancestors. He has done this work through his servant, Jesus Christ. Yes, that Jesus Christ, the one that you recently turned over to Pilate to have crucified, 
the one that you chose a murderer for to be freed instead of him. It's the man that you disowned and killed. And it is through him that has risen. And it is in his name. And the faith of this man has shown in his name that he has been healed. So Peter closes by saying, look, I know you made a mistake. And now you know you made a mistake. And I know that you did so because you didn't understand. You didn't understand because it was God's plan that Jesus would die and suffer and be resurrected. However, now, now you know. Now you know and you see that there is power in the name of the risen Christ. And because of that, it is time for you to turn away from your sin and repent. So have you ever made an honest mistake in your life? Now I have to tell you, if you don't think you've ever made an honest mistake in your life, that means one of two things. Either you need to search your memory a little bit harder, or all the mistakes you've ever made have been on purpose. So sure, we've all made honest mistakes in our lives. We've done things where we are working on an assumption only to find out that we were wrong. So I was thinking this week about a time when I was a kid and I got in trouble. And it didn't happen often, right? So, but this time I did. So I was probably in the fifth or sixth grade and I heard a joke on the playground that day. And I remember how everyone on the playground was laughing at the joke. And being around 12 years old, I started joining in laughing with them. Now here's the problem. I didn't really understand the joke. You see, I thought it meant one thing, but it actually meant something else. And it turns out the joke was a pretty dirty one. So as such, I will not be telling it from the pulpit today. But so far, I would have been okay, right? Here is where the mistake comes in. See, when I was growing up, my best friend was a girl, and her name was JP. And it's not uncommon for us to be picked up by each other's parents after school. And on this particular day, my dad picked me and JP up from school. And as we reached our house, I said to my dad, Hey, you want to hear a joke? Now, we love to tell each other jokes, and as I've gotten older, we tend to see who can come up with the worst dad joke between the two of us. And that's been the norm since I was a little. So he says, sure, tell me a joke. And I proceeded to tell him this off-color joke in front of JP. And now as I tell the joke, I'm thinking, oh man, he's going to love this. After all, everyone on the playground thought this was hilarious. So I finished telling the joke, and there is no laughter. And I think, huh, I must have told it wrong. And my dad turns and he looks at JP and he says, you need to go into the house. And now I'm beginning to figure out, oh no, I did something wrong here. Now, to his credit, he didn't yell at me or ground me or wash my mouth out with soap that day. He simply asked me, do you understand what you just said? I told him, no, I, I really didn't get it. I just knew everyone else had laughed at it. And he explained to me that this wasn't a joke that, you should, that should be told, especially in mixed company. So now I know that I should not tell that joke in front of, well, quite honestly, anyone really, because it is, yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> so this is what Peter was actually saying to the people. Look, you made a mistake. You killed the Messiah. And you made a mistake because you didn't know. But now you know. Now you know that you need to repent and turn away from your sin and believe in Jesus so you can be saved. Well, now we know too. Everyone who has heard this today now has this knowledge. And we know that we need to turn away from the things that are causing us to make mistakes and to sin in our life. 
This is not a new thing for many of you. But we also know that we don't always use this knowledge the way that we should. You see, unfortunately for us, our lives tend to go more like this. We make a mistake, we are corrected, and then we make the mistake again. You see, the first time, it might be an honest mistake. But once we know it is a mistake, it is up to us to not allow it to happen again. So I'll put it to you this way. If my, after my dad corrected me, telling me this joke was not appropriate to tell in front of, well, anyone, and that I proceeded to walk into the house and tell it to my mom, it would have no longer been an honest mistake. Now, I didn't do this, as witnessed by the fact that I'm standing before you today. <laughs> but you see, making mistakes or sinning is something that is human. We all know that none of us are perfect. We all know that despite our best efforts, and no matter how hard we try, we will still sin. And there is a price to be paid for that sin. And we know from the Bible, the wages of sin are death. However, we know that we can be corrected. And we know that our sin can be taken away from us by repenting, believing, and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, this does not give us a life free of responsibility. If anything, it gives us a life of more responsibility. You see, it means that we must be doing our best to turn away from our sins. Now, I don't care if you've made that same mistake a million times. I truly believe that God will forgive you if you ask for it. However, he wants us to do what we can to atone for those sins or those mistakes. And he wants us to do what we can to make sure that we don't repeat them again. So for me in the story today, atonement meant I needed to apologize to my dad and then go in and apologize for telling a dirty, dirty joke in front of my friend JP. <laughs> and her response was, you know what, Eric? I didn't get it either. <laughs> but I'm sure glad that you said it to your dad, so now I know not to say it to mine. So for us as followers of Christ, the atonement is to ask for the forgiveness of God and to, to do what we need to do to make sure that we make things right with anyone that we may have wronged. And then to strive not to commit the same mistake again. And you might be listening to the sermon today and thinking to yourself, wow, cute story about an honest mistake. But my life, the thing in my life is so much bigger than what you talked about today. And it has become an overwhelming, constant presence. And I can't possibly stop it at this point. Well, I say to you, take heart, because you are not alone. You see, just like the lame beggar, you have Jesus. And I'm confident that if you're willing to give that thing fully to Jesus Christ, the thing that is causing you to sin, the thing that is crippling you just like the beggar, then you can stand up and you can walk again. And you also need to know this. You don't walk this road alone. No matter what it is. You have people right here today in this community that love you. Ones that are willing to help you overcome that problem. Ones that are willing to strengthen, help you strengthen yourself through Jesus. You see, we're all sinners. We are all people that make mistakes. We like to think sometimes that we're the only ones that could possibly understand the things in our life that are causing us to sin. But the truth is there's someone here today that probably understands more than you could ever know. And the truth is besides that person here on earth, there is a savior that has already paid the cost for your sins. And he wants to be there with you. And he wants to walk with you as you commit to repenting and to leaving those sins behind. So my challenges for you this week are these. Is there something in your life you need to repent about? And is there something that you know is causing you to sin? And what do you need to do in order to stop making the same mistake over and over again? Amen.